the power of sintering. Sintering is a thermal process um, of converting loose and fine particles into a solid coherent mass by heat and or pressure without reaching a melting stage. It's a basic description of very complex process and who knows it better than the specialists from MIM and binder jetting technologies? Please let me welcome our today's guest. Mr. Andrew Klein, a global di uh, director of technology in X1. Hello, Andrew. And Mr. Alan Bird, an engineering uh, manager at Advanced Forming Technology Hungary, part of RAC Group. Hello. To understand why the MIM and sintering are connected and what uh, binder jetting and sintering has in common, we need to start from the very beginning. Maybe we can start from a binder jetting. Andrew, can you please take it from here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Richard, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, so I'll give a short presentation uh, talking about X1, a uh, brief company overview, uh, talk about the binder jet process, some of the benefits of binder jetting, and then really how to interact with X1 uh, and our binder jet 3D printing process. So wait for the presentation to come up and then I'll get going. There we go. All right. So uh, quick company overview. So X1, uh, we were founded uh, in the mid 1990s as a 3D division of Extrude Hone. So we've been doing binder jetting for about 25 years at this point. Um, today we are, we've grown into a publicly traded 3D printing company um, with operations around, around the world. Um, we have about 300 issued and pending patents all related to binder jetting. Um, and when we talk about binder jetting again, or thinking the powder, the printing process, but then also the centering process at the end, which again is I think where you see the most correlations to the MIM industry. Um, in terms of uh, what we sell, so we're primarily a uh, machine uh, provider. So we sell printers and this, all the ancillary equipment that goes with the 3D printer, um, but we also have a big business where we sell 3D printed parts. So we have adoption centers throughout the world um, that supply parts to customers, um, both in sand molds and cores, um, for the casting industry, um, but then also for direct metal or direct ceramic 3D printing. Um, one of the more interesting uh, products that we've just started to promote, even though we've been working on it for a long time, is 3D printed tooling solutions. So that's a way to take um, either uh, sand, uh, sand molds and then coat them with a uh, coat them with some type of epoxy um, to turn them into a mold, or actually printing in a traditional tool steel like an M2 or an H13. In terms of who we are as a company, again, I mentioned we're a global uh, global binder jetting company. Our headquarters is based just outside of Pittsburgh in the United States. Um, we have a nice large facility uh, a little bit outside of Munich uh, that's based where our sand operations are based and then an adoption center uh, located outside of Tokyo as well. Um, and then you can see all the green dots are our different sales locations throughout the world. Um, and again, you see the note on there that we have about 300 machines installed worldwide. Again, I mentioned binder jet 3D printers. So this is our current lineup of metal binder jet 3D printers. So from left to right, you can see our Inevent Pro, which is our newest 3D printer. Um, so that's replacing, uh, or not replacing, but uh, sort of advancing the technology that's been on the market for a long time in our Inevent Plus. So that's the uh, heavily used in research institutes and R&D labs to really develop binder jet technology. And then it scales um, to the 25 Pro, which is our small production printer. That again, has been in the market for about three years um, with a lot of customers who are using it in production environments and then some in R&D as well. Um, and then the largest printer, the X1160 Pro, um, which is our biggest metal 3D, 3D printer, has a build box volume of 160 liters. And again, the target for that is really um, high volume production. And those machines are uh, going through acceptance, acceptance testing at our customers now. For anyone not familiar with the binder jetting process, um, it starts just as any other 3D printing process where you have your digital fire file prep and then ultimately prepping your machine and prepping your powder to go into that machine. Uh, once you get started, just like with your powder bed fusion processes, um, you deposit a thin layer of powder. But in this case, instead of uh, using a heat source to weld the particles together, you're using basically an inkjet printhead to just selectively deposit binder just where you want the part to be. Um, at that point, the build box lowers. Uh, you apply a little bit of heat to the bed, 
and then you deposit another layer of powder and another layer of binder. And this happens iteratively until all the parts in your bed are printed. Um, again, since we're focusing on metals here, what happens next with the metal printer is the entire build box goes into a carrying oven. Um, this removes uh, any of the remaining carrier from the from the binder and leaves you to, just with the green part. So just with metal or ceramic powder and the polymer holding that pow holding that part together. And you go through a depowdering stage where you remove any unbound powder, and then you go into a sintering furnace to do debind and sinter. And at that point, again, you're very similar to a MIM part when you're going into that furnace. Uh, you can see in the top right an illustration of really what we believe at X1 is our differentiating technology on the uh, recoder. And what that is, is it's what we call a triple advanced compaction technology. So what that takes is it combines the uh, ultrasonic dispenser, which enables you to dispense fine cohesive powders and evenly across the bed, um, a spreading roller, which uh, essentially spreads, flings the powder forward um, to give you a smooth layer in front of your smoothing roller that ultimately does that compaction and gives you a nice uniform density. So with that, you're able to get really good cream density uniformity across the bed, which then going into the furnace enables you to get consistent printed tolerances out of your parts. Talking about the sintering furnace, um, sintering is where, again, binder jetting requires the parts for making metal parts, requires parts to be sintered at the end. And we really start with using metal injection molding profiles and then tweaking them slightly for our binder um, or our powders that we use. Um, so again, the starting point is going to the MIM handbook and looking for what temperature uh, do we center 316, 316L at? Um, and we go to that temperature and you get about 97 to 98% dense. Um, Cause again, we're using MIM powders and MIM furnaces to do that. But again, so really the differentiation in binder jetting is around how do you get consistent parts out of your printer? And if you can get consistent parts out of your printer, then again, we're leveraging uh, MIM centering furnaces to be able to get good parts out of the furnace. Talking about materials, again, we uh, at X1, we classify our materials in three, three different ways. Um, the first one is third-party qualified. So that's a material that we have a lot of experience with. Um, we can provide full data sheets. Um, we have a lot of experience with sort of how the powder ages over time and understanding how to keep consistent powder in the system. Um, those are materials like 316L and 17.4, and then some newer qualified materials like Inconel 718 um, and M2 tool steel. Um, on the customer qualified side, in a minute, I'm going to talk about sort of how important our customer and our collaborative relationships are. So one of the benefits of binder jet printers is they're typically open source. And in an excellence case, we have open source printers, so you can put your own material into the printer. So customer qualified materials are materials that our customers have put into materials and developed process settings for and are either making parts internally or providing parts to their customers. Um, and then finally, R&D qualified materials, um, which are materials that are at various stages of development. And we've printed them a few times. Um, so they're ready to be third-party qualified. Just quickly, not going to get into all the binders, but there's a lot of different binders that we can use in our systems. And in some cases, it's material dependent, um, but typically the one we're going to use the most is our clean fuse binder. And that's a binder that um, the real benefit of it is it allows you to print fast. Um, it gives you high green strength. Again, I think we're going to, we'll talk more later, but um, we're not getting to the green strength that you would get out of a MIM part, um, but it's, they're, they're strong enough to be powder and very handleable in the green state. Um, but then also it doesn't leave any carbon um, after sintering. So you can get the same chemistry that you would get out of them in part. So sort of the benefits of why would you go with 3D printing? Um, speed. Again, you're not making molds um, so you can print very fast. And um, with that, do rapid design changes and fast iterations. Um, you can also, it's a very flexible process. So again, I mentioned the list of powders that we can print with. Um, and again, the same printer that prints 316L, you can clean it and the next day be printing Inconel 718. Um, waste reduction, again, we like, really like to talk about how there's very little waste in the binder jetting process. The only waste that you may have is if you have to use a metal, uh, a live setter for centering your part, but otherwise it's a very low waste process. And then really the, the design freedom that you have with printing parts um, is, Again, you can you can make shapes that you can't make with any other technology. This is just a quick example uh, showing a part that we did um, with the company Altair, looking at a structural component for the automotive industry. Um, in the top right, you can see the original part. You can see that, uh, again, it's sort of bulky, as you'd expect. 
um, and then the topologically optimized part in the bottom right that we were able to print um, to make it 45% lighter out of 316 now. And finally, I, again, I mentioned our collaboration partners and how important that is to us at X1. And you can see a, a, a short list of some of our partners here. But again, it's really important to us that when we work with our customers, that they also become our development partners and we work together both to advance binder jetting, but also to make sure that we're developing their applications and making sure that they can take their parts into production. And, and then finally, um, again, really, this is my one promotional slide, um, but just uh, encouraging you for people who are not familiar with binder jetting, again, we have our adoption centers uh, for metal, both in Germany and in the US. So we really encourage you to reach out to our teams. Um, if there's a part that you think might make sense for binder jetting, or you want our team to look at and give you advice on how it would work in the binder jetting process, um, definitely we encourage you to reach out to us and we'll be happy to work with you. Thank you very much for a very knowledgeable presentation. So now when we know a little bit more about uh, binder jetting, uh, I have a question to Alan. Alan, can't you please shed some light on MIM technology? So MIM technology is, uh, I'll start the presentation here, is we are advanced forming technology in Rachak, Hungary. We do metal injection molding, we, which makes uh, small, metal parts of 3D complexity in either steel or stainless steel and going to the automotive industries, consumer industries, or medical and firearms. Uh, you can see our industry, we do tool making, part making, rapid prototyping, and, and some plastics in, in different locations. Uh, we want to use like a holistic approach not just making parts, but the prototyping, the tooling, post-processing, and any metallurgical um, things you might be able to use. What are sales by market? You know, right now our biggest one is uh, transportation. We do automotive with uh, turbo vanes, uh, fuel injector parts, valve seats, some other things like that. And consumer market, we say that by power tool parts, saw blade clamps, and some other things. And they have firearms parts made in and made in the US and then there are some medical parts and a small amount of aerospace parts. And like I said, for the, the MIM has little waste also when you have the high value materials with a lot of nickel. So what is MIM? It's the combination of uh, two technologies, plastic injection molding, which gives you the formability of plastic of three dimensional parts. And then you get the uh, strength of metal when you combine these two for the metal injection molding. So we want complex shapes, economical cost, and either steel or stainless steel or stainless steel. And we prefer volumes of 10,000 or more. More The more parts, the better, going up to into the millions. Uh, this is a basic slide of the MIM process where you have the first, we make the compounding of the material where we combine the powder and the binders to make the feedstock that goes into the uh, plastic injection mold and that's where you form the part as the green part and then you have the debinder it's a solvent debind that we use and that removes 90 percent of the binder it's a step to, to quicken up that part and then it goes into the sintering oven and um, that's why we're here for the sake of work because we do use our sintering ovens and that's when it gets down goes for about a 24 to 28 hour pro heating process and that brings removes all of the binders and you have dense metal up to 97 to 98% full on metal. Uh, our shrink factors are 15 to 25%. We have three locations. One is in Deland, Florida. Uh, they mainly focus on medical parts like surgical parts. Longmont, Colorado, which is north of Denver. They do some automotive and mainly uh, defense industries. And here we are in Rechag, Hungary, and we focus on a split between automotive of turbocharger vanes and uh, power tool parts. Um, these are the, this slide shows the capabilities of each of the three locations, uh, whereas the Longmont and, and Hungarian locations are, are very similar and the Deland four locations is more set up for uh, medical parts. shows the different uh, moldings of the three locations, Florida, Colorado, and Hungary. Here in Hungary, we have 16 machines, and we're certainly looking at um, more machines as, as, as the uh, volume of the turbochargers increase. 
Another side showing the uh, different furnaces here between uh, Florida, Colorado, and Hungary. So you can see that's one of the uh, Seiko forests that we use for centering the parts. Um, this shows another slide of the big, of all the molding machines. They have 59 molding machines in Colorado. You can see how much that works. Molding machine principles, basic injection molding machines, but the same thing as you'd use in plastics that gives you all the 3D form ability that could use. And we use plastic injection molding machines. What are mold making capabilities? So to summarize, um, we actually have in America, they do their tooling, but in, in Hungary, we have vendors that are here in the Budapest area and we control all our tooling there. And that can be, you know, anywhere from six weeks to 10 weeks to make an eight cavity tool. And that's, but we control all the design and get, and all the building of the molding. Um, what are mold powder characteristics? Typical powders are either water atomized or gas atomized. They have a mean particle size of about uh, 20 microns, generally spherical shape for the gas atomized, but they go to the water atomized, which is a little more jagged. Each one different has its own advantages and disadvantages. We generally find the gas atomized work a little bit better. Uh, you can see here some pictures of the gas atomized. Uh, the top picture you know, shows the spherical particles either made, um, done with nitrogen or argon the spherical particles let it mold a little bit better um the water ones are a little bit more jagged but they stick better together so we just have to find the right one for the part um this shows our compounding area in hungary how we uh, compound the feedstock with our mixers and our extruder And these are the granulation of the formula that's going into the molding machine as after it's been compounded when you mix the metal powder and the plastics. And then when that's done, the thing about the MIM material is you can recycle the runners. We don't, we, there's no waste. It goes right back in there. Not like plastics where the runners go away or they get um, thrown away or it takes them longer to recycle. Ours are automatically just reground, put with the virgin batch, and then they're molded again. Um, we check the density after centering with pycnometers. Um, because it's much more accurate than doing the water density for anything with holes in it or things that would trap air. Um, here we're going to show you, uh, we have the debinding techniques. We use solvent debind here. There is thermal that they use for smaller parts, but we mainly use solvent, uh, percolar or ethylene with a six to 10 hour cycle time to extract 90% of the binder. Um, you can see the three phases here, the molded, the green part with the, with the particles, and then it removed in the brown with the binder. And then you have the loss of the extractable binder. We generally want 90% loss. Um, this is a picture of our debind unit. It's a little sunny, but you can see it. Um, so, and then this is coming into our centering furnace here from Seiko. You know, it shows that we either have a four zig zone capacity and especially with turbocharger veins, we can center upwards of 60,000 veins in one centering cycle, 24 to 28 hours. This, this shows typically of how the parts are staged in graphite furnaces with ceramic trays on them to hold them through the thermal process with protective gas. And another picture of how the, how the centering furnaces work. These are batch centering furnaces with their, uh, with their soak times and all the, graphite furniture. Um, this typical centering ramp, how it's gone, how it's controlled. And then this slide is again, so you have the molded part in the green with the binders, then it's debound with the binder removed. And then with the MIM part, you get a shrink, you get a shrink of anywhere 15 to 25%, which is much bigger than shrink rate than the uh, plastics industry. And we go to 96 to almost 99% dense after that center part is done. Our uh, mold shrink factor, like we said, you can see the difference in the part. That's pretty big. And one question we get is what tolerances do you accept? That's generally a plus or minus a half percentage. If it needs something tight, half a percent. If something's tighter, we can machine it. But most dimensions in the industry will fall within that and can be done. 
and maybe only a grind or a ream is required. So it really reduces any machining that's done from a rot part. And then we check with density and carbon. And they also can check hardness, micro hardness or uh, macro hardness, HRC, HRA. Our certifications are um, aerospace in America and Hungary, we have uh, TS. And right now we also have IATF. Florida does the uh, medical certification, 13485. Uh, secondary operations, we do coining, um, machining, sorting, um, any heat treat machining, any of these things are it can be done so the customer gets the finished part. You can see the different types of coiners here, collet coiner, flat coiner, just to knock the part into shape in case it gets distorted off centering. This is done on a lot of parts. Um, after centering, you generally get some uh, surface finish. You would just want to smooth out a little bit. So we tumble all, all the parts, knocks off any sharp edges and smooths out the finish so the operators can handle it. And you can see our different um, external capabilities, black oxide, passivation, we do, we do have ultrasonic cleaning uh, in-house, bead blasting to smooth up the finishes, heat treats, and um, full, uh, we do PPAP inspections in-house, but we can also have uh, full house uh, external inspection and spectral analysis outside. They need, these slides will show some design um, criteria for MIM and materials so generally we use the stainless is uh 300 series 310 hk30 316 um 420 440 in that range and then for the 174 for the stainlesses for the non-stainless we use 4605 which is two percent nickel iron 4140 1010 for those other ones that, that go into some defense industries, uh, we have done 713, 718, uh, Inconel here, Nymonic 90. Those are all things that, that can be done, Have we have done here in MIM. Uh, this slide shows the comparison of HK30, which is one of the biggest materials we run here, versus rot parts versus casted parts. And we can show them that we are equal or better to those mechanical properties. This is one question we get a lot of you know if we use the MIM properties will it have the same mechanical properties after centering and this slide gives data said yes indeed we do have the same mechanical properties after centering or even better um, than machined rot stock this just slide is very quick it shows the different technologies competing with uh, powder metallurgy machining stamping die casting screw machining um, when you combine the three facets of MIM, which is uh, small parts, about the, maybe the size of a golf ball, steel or stainless steel, volume, um, like 10,000 or more pieces per year, and complexity, and you really get a good fit for the MIM technology. Um, there's your characteristics of the MIM. We have through holes, threads, chamfers, all these things that just make the, that fit into what defines a MIM part. These are some pictures, you know, of a cavity ID, how they're going to look as, as coming out as they're molded. Um, ejector pin marks, which are showing there. Threads can be done. We do machine them, but we have internal and external threads. Um, parting lines, that's part of the molding process. They're shown um, how our runners look. We can either have an edge gate runner or a full runner or a three plate mold, which separates the runner from the, from the part. These are the gates that are shown like that. And these are just some design guidelines. So we, you know, we can show radii, mass range, 0.1 to 400, but we like, you know, 10, 30, 50 micro, uh, grams. Our veins run at about three to 10 grams each. That's really kind of the sweet spot. Um, this also show, this is the big question. I think I mentioned it. We have the plus or minus a half percent on the dimensions. And it, we do get a pretty well uniform shrink. If there's something needed is tighter than the half uh, percent, then you know we do machine or coin it in there. Uh, the, this slide shows just transitioning. These are some things for the molding, so we get better flow in the in the in the MIM molding process. 
And coring is very important. When you're molding in MIM, you don't want any dead mass. You want a uniform wall thickness. It also reduces the needed mass of the part and gives for uh, better molding characteristics and less mold defects. Um, when a part is sintered, it goes into the, the Seiko furnaces. The parts are almost at a liquid state. They're very almost near the melting temperatures of the metal. So if it's not supported, it'll sag and almost fall down. So we do have center, ceramic centering um, furniture trays that hold them up in that state. And you can see it come down like that. And then this slide shows if there's a fork or something's going to drag, sometimes we put a bridge in there to keep the parts straight and then we can machine it out. This is a picture of our centering trays if the part's not flat. And then what makes a MIM part? Well, the first PM part is two dimensional. If you can just open and close mold it, it makes more sense for a MIM. But if it's MIM, you have a 3D part, you can get it out of a mold with a slide and it has that complex shape. That's where MIM is a better fit. The slide shows better MIM or not. So if you go from left to right, you can see where the third hole is put in there. We can put in threads in the parting line. Then it makes more sense for a MIM part. Cons part consolidation is a big one. You can show how three parts can be put into one for MIM. And then this are some actual part that was done that way with two parts going into one. And then these are some uh, slide examples of industry. There's electronics industry, um, computers, circuit boards, fiber optics. These are the automotive applications. You can see turbo vanes, impellers, uh, transmission clevis, uh, fuel injectors. And then this can, the case studies is a fuel injector thing. It's only five millimeter wide. Um, it made from 440, has to be 60 HRC um, hard. But when you have 12 to 15 million you need per year, there's just no other technology that can make this economically. You can't, it's very difficult to cast it. You can't machine it. Investment casting would probably be nowhere near me cost competitive. So this is a very good example of how MIM is a good fit for this technology. The next one you can see where we use for the consumer industries, the power slot, the power saw, the whole slide clamps. And then these are some examples of medical parts where you have surgical things or um, instruments or uh, scalpel holders and aerospace parts, less volume, but um, different materials with high nickel content. So you don't get the waste you would do of a machining. And that's the MIM process from AFT. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, Alan, thank you very much for a comprehensive pack of knowledge. Uh, it was also really nice to see a Seco Warwick furnace uh, in action. Uh, I know this information uh, was shown during the pre both presentation, but if we could sum up once again, what's the target industry that you are aiming? What kind of industry are being represented by your customers and potential customers? Uh, Andrew, maybe we can start from binder jetting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that luckily the application space for binder jetting just uh, seem to be changing every day and luckily always growing. Um, I think the early adopters that you see are people who are already using powder metallurgy technologies. So people in the uh, firearm space or again, small electronics, men device. Um, I think some of the bigger markets that we're seeing come out, especially for direct metal printing, are going to be more in automotive for really, again, high volume, high value applications. Um, and then I think in medical as well. Okay. And how about uh, MIM, Alan? So what we target generally is, is automotive because it has the, it generally has a good mix of the high volume, the complexity and the materials that, that fit in, in for MIM. So it's, you know, it takes a while to get developed into the, into the automotive, but once it gets confirmed and, and qualified, then it runs a long time and it is a good fit for MIM and can go for several generations. Is, and the other industry we like to look at is the, you know, we call it the consumer industry, but it's not limited to power tools. We have things in, you know, that you know, make saws, but we also have make, make parts here for recreation industry, some rock climbing parts. And we have once even goes into an avalanche protection part. So there, you know, the good thing with MIM is there's, all different kinds of applications if you if it becomes the right fit. 
So technically speaking, in both uh, situations, the target customer is almost limited. As long as you are in the need of metal or plastic parts like um, the MIM that you were mentioning. Okay. The feedstock for both technology is um, metal powder. Uh, what is the group of metal that is being commonly used for MIM? Um, the groups of metal is stainless steels, mainly 300 series, 310, 304, 316. Uh, 400, which which is the Martin Siddick, 420, 440, we see that a lot. 17.4 for this, 17.4 pH for that stainless. Um, those are the those are the big runners. On the low carbon steel side, is 2% nickel iron is a big one. 41.40, and some we even do 4% and 8% nickel iron. That's on the non carbon side. There is even some one that's 10.10. We have one. I've seen some S7 and M2 as well okay andrew how about binder jetting can we consider it as a similar group of metals yeah so again it's very similar similar and i think as i mentioned we really like to leverage what mim's already done in terms of knowing sort of about making the powders and making them consistent but then also on the centering side of how to center them so i think yeah i think you see a lot of 316l and 17.4 to start with uh transitioning to some of the nickel alloys and then I think some of the more exciting alloys we're working on are uh, aluminum and titanium. So some of the reactive uh, lightweight metals, and then also a lot of applications, both for thermal and electrical uh, and copper. This is also something that I wanted to, to ask you. Is there any development that is being run in terms of uh, metal powders? Somehow, Andrew already answered it on that uh, question, but is there anything more that uh, the binder jetting R&D is working in terms of uh, metal powders? Yeah, so again, definitely, we really like to leverage the MIM supply chain for powders just because it's already established and there's, again, it's robust from a quality of the powder, but also in terms of the cost of the powders. Um, I think you see some R&D looking at whether it's bimodal or trimodal distributions, uh, different coatings on powders. Uh, so there's some really innovative stuff that you can do with the systems. But I think as we look toward what's really going to apply to mass production, it's going to be those same conventional alloys that we're using in MIM. Okay. Alan, what's the situation for MIM? Is there any R&D process for a new powders? Is there any need or maybe customers are getting uh, what, what, uh, what they need right now? Um, kind of both. We get, we, you know, we try to steer the customers into existing powders, obviously to get that helps them get um, faster to production for their parts. But um, we do have see some offshoots um, um, in the stainless steels, maybe some higher temperature applications in the automotive um, that, that they are trying that they are working on developments there. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we have that you know, we have that and we do we do want to qualify different and new materials. I think like Andrew said, yes, we do have some aerospace stuff that, you know, that we do that they want to get, get working on for MIM as well. Okay. Thank you for that. Assuming that the both technologies are using a similar type of even the same type of uh, metal powders, can we use actually the same powder in one uh, technology and uh, with the other? Or maybe there are some differences, I don't know, in terms of uh, the size or the grains and etc. Yeah, so from my side, again, we're typically using the same particle size distribution that we're using in MIM. Uh, so the, the raw powder feedstock is the same, but in our case, we're only depositing the binder after it's print or after it's spread into the bed. Whereas in MIM, you're typically pre-mixing or not typically, you are pre-mixing uh, the binder and the powder together. Okay. How about the MIM? Can you use a, a, a powder that was, for example, specially made for a binder jetting? Or there is no um, such thing like a special made powder. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 I see because they're trying, you know, they're, like you said, they're leveraging the MIM supply chain and that makes sense. But going the other way, we really don't, you know, we're not looking at that, but it doesn't mean it can't happen, but that, that, that's, that's how it works for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 
The another, and we can call it a secret ingredient for both technology is Binder. And I know that I should uh, be careful about asking this question because uh, often this is an area of know-how the company and uh, not all the information can, uh, can be shared. But uh, if we can discuss a little bit about the uh, Binder, is it the same kind of Binder that is being used in MIM and uh, Binder Jetting? Maybe we can start from Alan. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we typically use waxes and polypropylenes for our binders. That's, that, that's pretty common in the industry. I don't know if the binder jetting needs to tweak that or not, but that, that, that's what, that, that's what's used in, in our industry to, to mainly keep the binder together with a metal powder. Mm. Okay. Okay. And Andrew, how about binder jetting? Yeah. So one of the major differences again, is that we, the binder we use, so we don't use wax in the binder jet process. So we only have that polymer binder that's holding the parts together. Um, so again, it's, it's typically, again, as you said, it's, uh, it's a little bit of the secret sauce of binder jetting, but it's typically, you're going to have a polymer that's dissolved in some type of solvent or carrier, uh, to get, uh, printed. And then during the curing process, that carrier gets driven off. So all that you have left, uh, before going into your, uh, Debind and center furnace is just uh, metal powder held together by that polymer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the information. And uh, in terms of quantity of binder in the green part, is there any difference? How the situation looks in binder jacking thing? What's the quantity of binder that uh, can we be uh, can we find in the green part? Yeah, so typically, it's only about one weight percent. Oh. And how about the MIM, Alan? We're a little higher than that. Like you know, said Andrew. Andrew said they don't use wax, so the wax is a pretty heavy component. So we're making three or four percent, not not one. Okay. So as always, the devil is in details, and even if there is a lot of similarities uh, among those two technologies, there are some slight uh, slight difference that uh, we can also uh, point out. Okay, so please tell me what is happening with the binder during uh, the binding and sintering process. What is happening in the furnace with the with the with the binder inside the green part? Well, from the MIM side, after the debind, is you've removed ninety percent of it. You want to you want to minimize that uh, sintering cycle. You know, just due to the electrical consumption. Um, so with that last part is that last part is the binder is removed by the uh the low pressure and the and the push gas as it as the as the pressure and the temperature ramp up okay as far as i okay okay i fully understand uh, andrew as far as i know that the binding and the sintering process is usually is taking a place in the furnace in terms of binder jetting is that correct Yep, exactly. So again, we since that sort of second stage of debind and center that you do in the MIM process, um, we're doing a very similar process to that. Again, we just don't have your solvent debind that occurs before. Okay. I believe in the in this point of our discussion, it is worth to underline that um, uh, furnace for sintering is not just a standard furnace. It needs to be equipped with the additional uh, features like the binder cage, like the binder trap. So everything that will prevent uh, the furnace itself, but also the process part from the potential negative influence of the binder that is being evaporated during the process. Is that somehow correct for from the, from the binder point of view? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Alan. great. Alan, uh, yeah, we, what's we the yeah? Have... What's the situation from MIM point of view? Because we know that the the binding is usually taking place before sintering. What's 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 the situation here? It's it's so like I said, it's it, the demining is two is essentially two steps. You have most of the debind happening in the in the pre-centering phase and the debind phase, but not all of it. So when you get into your first ramp into the centering furnace, that's when the binders, that's when all the rest of the binders removed, and then the increasing heat um, keeps the part retained together until it does the shrink at the high temperature and fuses together. So yes, to your question, 
we do have to have traps in the in the furnace design to catch the wax as it comes out of solution. Yeah. Getting back to our discussion about the powders, it is also, I believe, worth to underline that depend on the type of binder, uh, the temperature of the process is also strongly connected. So from the furnace construction point of view, what's the best uh, temperature range for the furnace for MIM process? A will run between 1,200 degrees and 1,400 degrees to get the fully centered parts because the, the different metals do have different peak temperatures and it can it can vary a lot mm. to hit the to hit the max density. Okay, so usually this is a range of the temperature that you are using during during the MIM process. And what the situ what's the situation for binder jetting? So, so yeah, it's ex it's exactly the same. Um, again, if you're at a stainless steel, you're closer to 1400C, or if you're at nickel alloy, you might be in the 12 to 1300C range. Okay. We discuss about the temperature. We also discuss about the binder trap. What other features uh, from the perspective of furnace construction has a direct influence on the successful process? Uh, maybe, I don't know, the gases, the process gases that you are using or the material, the chamber uh, that is being constructed. Is there any other features that is good uh, to have in the furnace while the process Maybe we can start from, from binder jetting. Yeah, so again, I think it's uh, it's really a lot, really material dependent. So whether it needs to be a graphite um, or a metal hot zone, uh, the gases that we need, again, if we're doing a 316L, we'll typically use hydrogen, uh, whereas in some cases we need nitrogen or argon or deep vacuum. Um, so I think it's, uh, again, really material dependent. But again, I think you'll hear a similar answer from Alan in saying that it's sort of that solid furnace construction makes a big difference and making sure that you don't have a lot of oxygen in the process is really, uh, really important to get good consistent centering and mechanical properties. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Alan, how about the MIM? Yes, for us, it's, you know, um, nitrogen argon or a mix of the two, making sure that the furnace can pump down, get the get down to the vacuum levels. Uh, it's clean. Uh, proper heat exchanges and seals properly so you don't have leaks. Now, obviously when you run hundreds of centering run, it's gonna it's gonna you know need maintenance and go over time. But those are the important things for making sure if you have a successful centering run. And like you said, we have graphite fixtures and ceramic. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for the answer. So Unfortunately, the time is almost up, so uh, please let me sum up uh, for the very end of um, this panel. Uh, I believe the sintering is playing really important role in both processes, and it has a direct influence on the final part um, quality. As always, the devil is in details, and not always the perfect setup of the furnace for MIM will be the perfect setup for the binder jetting furnace and vice versa. But I believe it's a job for a furnace uh, creator to uh, put that uh, all the process uh, and all the parts in the right setup according to customers' needs. Gentlemen, thank you very much for a really nice discussion and uh, thank you very much for your attention.